Hello, my loves. Happy Sunday. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you're all doing fabulous today. Welcome to A Feminine Impression. This is Dr. Michelle Daff, and I am your host today. We're talking about the book When Women Pray by T.D. Jakes. And today we're discussing the Samaritan woman. So I just want to welcome all of you beautiful ladies from all over the world. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Give you a second to log in. I hope your week has been going great. It's getting really hot here in California. It's hot, <laughs> but I'm not complaining. I love, love, love the weather. Welcome, ladies. So great to see you. Thank you for all of you who have been waiting for this. This is going to be a really beautiful lesson where we're going to talk about how God sees you. So just give you a couple seconds and then we'll get started. Before we get into the video, I want to first thank each and every one of you ladies who joins me live every week or who comes back and watches. I appreciate your support. I have been so blessed by your testimonies. I've been getting so many messages about how these live sessions have been changing your life. The fact that you've been praying more, getting closer to God, and seeing actual miracles happen in your life. As a matter of fact, there was a testimony last week where, let me see if I can find it. We had a woman who left a comment. Apparently she was homeless and she had been letting us know that she was going through a really tough time and didn't know, you know, what was going to come of it, but she was going to trust God. And I was elated when I saw her comments. She came back to update us and her name on YouTube is Blocka Waka. And this is her message to us. She says, hello, everyone. I want to testify what God has done for me. Previously, I said that I was homeless, but I spent two weeks outside. Nowhere to go. No shower. No nothing. On my periods, I wanted to kill myself, but God sent someone to pay all the bills that were due, and I'm not homeless anymore. I'm crying while writing because I thought God abandoned me. I prayed so hard and so much. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. And I want to say thank you to you, my dear, for coming back and giving that testimony. It is so powerful when you truly take these things into your own hands, where it's not just a conversation, it's something you're really using in your everyday life and watching God work. And that's why I'm here. I'm here none other than to share the good news of Jesus and how he can impact your life because I have better things. <laughs> I have better things to do with my time. But there's nothing more rewarding than seeing God shine in your lives and giving you the knowledge that you need to be able to live your best life. If he did that for me, and I know I am the last person that deserves that, I want you to know that he can do it for you. And that's why I'm here. That's what we're talking about today, the importance of understanding that God sees you and also sharing your testimony with the world so that they also can have an opportunity to get to know Jesus. So I want to say thank you for that. <laughs> and I also want to um, let you know that we are having a sale. If you don't know, I have my brand, Fine Forever Fragrances. And the debut fragrance is 2911. It's a beautiful, feminine, sensual fragrance. It's very sexy. It's just one of those fragrances that give you confidence and allows you to feel like a woman. So this fragrance has been doing really well. Everyone's been telling me how much they enjoy wearing it, all the compliments they're getting. And we're having a sale right now for Valentine's Day for 25% off if you use the code word VALENTINE. So if you're curious about the fragrance, this would be a really good time to purchase it and it would be a support to me and to the kingdom of God because what's special about this particular fragrance is that it is connected to the promises of God. So it's not just a beautiful fragrance, but it's something to remind you every day when you wear it or when you see it that God has plans for your life and you are not an accident, you have a purpose, 
and he is watching every single thing you do to make sure that you prosper. So visit findforever.com and purchase 2911. All right, I think we have a good amount of people here. We can go ahead and begin. So again, we are reading from the book because we get people who log on at different times. We're reading from the book, When Women Pray. And today we are talking about the Samaritan woman. And we are talking about her encounter with Jesus. The theme here is that when women pray, they are quenched of their thirst. And my theme for you is that God sees you and you are forgiven. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this. Go ahead and close your eyes. We're just going to thank God and allow his presence to be with us as we dive into the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being with us today. We thank you for allowing us to see a brand new day and to be together to fellowship in your name. We ask that you just allow us to be able to feel your presence as we go through your study, to allow us to be able to have full concentration on you. We bind up any distractions. We bind up anything that will stop us from being able to allow your word to sink into our spirit. We ask that you will let angels cover us throughout this time. We ask that your Holy Spirit just shine through us during this teaching and allow us to know that we are loved by you and forgiven by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, ladies. So if you don't have the book, no worries. You can read out of your Bible. We are reading from John chapter four. So you can go ahead and turn there if you like. It's in the New Testament. And I'm just going to go over the story of this woman because her story is very relatable, just like they all are. But this one, I feel if you're a woman who has anything in your life that maybe you're not proud of, Maybe society says that whatever you've gone through is something super shameful. This story, I feel, really speaks to that because it allows you to see how God doesn't care about how everyone else thinks of you, that he sees you for who you really are. And that's so important. Okay, so I'm going to read from John chapter 4. It says, when Jesus knew the Pharisees heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. He came to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about six in the evening. It, it was actually the sixth hour, so that's around noon. Different Bibles have different ways of translating that, but I think it's, there's a consensus that it was around noon. So it was like the middle of the day, super hot in the desert. And Jesus is going through Samaria, where typically... Jews did not want to go through that because there was this big conflict between the two and they would find a way to get around that. So he purposely went through there and went to sit at this well. Okay. Um, and he had disciples with him, but he sent his disciples away to go get lunch and he sat at the well by himself. So he was purposely doing this because he was purposely trying to meet someone specific. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, for his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me? A Samaritan woman, she asked him, for Jews don't asso associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God, who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, the woman said, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said, 
Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I give him will never get thirsty again, ever. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well, a well of water springing up from within him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You have correctly said, I don't have a husband, Jesus said, for you've had five husbands, and the man that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, yet you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, believe me, Woman, an hour is coming where you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such a people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know, the, I know that the Messiah is coming, who was called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. I am he, Jesus told her, the one speaking to you. And then from there, um, his disciples come back and this woman goes back into town and tells everyone that she met this man who's told her everything that she's ever done. And from there, it just the story continues where the people of the town had faith because of her story. And then Jesus ended up going there and doing some teachings. And then they had their own faith based on their encounters with him and listening to him. So she was a true evangelist in the finest way by taking on this word that he had given her, having faith in it, believing it, having that knowing and spreading the word. So this is a story we're going to chat about. I want to first talk about this woman and her life. So what's really interesting is that she was going to the well on her own without anyone. And culturally, during this time, women did things together. As a matter of fact, everyone did. It was just a very communal society where people spent time in groups and hospitality and things of that nature were really big. So the fact that she was by herself was a direct result of the fact that people didn't want to be around her. The women were talking about her and looked down on her because she had been with so many men. She'd had all these different husbands. And of course, that gave her a reputation. So the best time to go and draw the water, which I do think that they came multiple times a day. I don't think it was just one time because they had so many people and animals and bathing, all the things that water is necessary for. So they were coming to the well multiple times a day, but typically they would go in the morning when it's cool because, again, it's a desert. It's so hot and the water jugs are very heavy. But of course, it makes it better when you're with people and you're talking and time just goes by faster. You have help. So women would go together early in the morning. She was coming in the afternoon because she did not want to be with them, I'm sure because of the way that they treated her. And she just wanted to probably be left alone. The fact that she was there in the middle of the day kind of tells you that she purposely wanted to be isolated and was willing to suffer the heat and all of the, the fact that she wasn't going to get any help or have company because she just didn't want to deal with that. And the fact that Jesus was there talking to a woman was also very unusual because outside of the fact that the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along, women were not viewed as having very much worth in that sense, in that society. And for a man to be out just talking to a woman was very unusual. So he was, he had a certain confidence about him that let her know, okay, you're 
different. And um, we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about that. We're going to read from the book. I'm going to start on page 96. The other women drew their water together in the cool of the morning. They chatted as they walked, exchanging pleasantries and the latest gossip while the sun was just beginning to peek over the mountains. They worked together to pull the heavy jars up from the bottom of the well, dripping and sloshing as they pulled the rope so that no one was overwhelmed by the load. She used to join them, but no longer. She grew tired of knowing that they looked past back and forth whenever they mentioned their husband. With every cutting comment, such sweetness and sharpness from so many tongues, her fury had grown, threatening to overflow like one of the jars. I saw your second husband in the marketplace yesterday, or was that your third? In the fourth chapter, in the fourth chapter of God's gospel, <laughs> in the fourth chapter of John's gospel, we find another Bible character who was both nameless and famous. So who does this remind you of? We call her the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. She had no name in the Bible, just like the woman we talked about who had the issue of blood. She did not have a particular name, but she was still famous. You have heard this particular woman described as the Samaritan woman or the woman at the well. Unlike the woman with the issue of blood, this woman did not seek out Jesus. She was not looking for Jesus. In fact, she wasn't looking for anyone. Quite the opposite. She was trying to hide. She was laying low, honkering down, and doing her best to remain anonymous and unseen. And I want to know from you ladies in your own lives, have you ever had moments where you were laying low? where you were hiding out of embarrassment or shame. Has this ever happened to you in your home where maybe you've done something and you don't feel worthy of being in your family? So you just kind of left your bedroom and ate and just kind of kept to yourself, maybe at school, maybe when you were a teenager or even in college, you felt lonely or you felt like there was something about you that was so different than the other people. Maybe they were more affluent than you were. Maybe they were a different race and you just felt lonely and different. Or maybe you had something happen where you have a reputation. It could be a mistake that you made. You could even be someone who is a public figure, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's in politics and entertainment, where you've done something and people know and you're embarrassed about it. Or maybe it's not even you. Maybe it's your child who did something or your husband who did something and brought that embarrassment and shame onto you. So you don't feel comfortable now going to dinner parties or just being seen because it's a constant reminder of what you're going through. You could be hiding because you had something happen in your life that is really embarrassing. Maybe you lost your job. And now that you're jobless, looking for a job, people from your old job keep reaching out to you and asking you questions. And it's embarrassing to have to talk about the fact that you were fired. Or maybe you had a divorce and you're no longer with your husband. You have to face family members and friends who are constantly asking you, how's your marriage going? How's your husband? Knowing you don't have one anymore or you're separated. These are all things that we tend to feel very shameful and embarrassed about and we hide. But my question to you is, do you hide from God? If I could turn this off. That's a more that's a more important question. Do you hide from God? When we go through these things that are so embarrassing in the world, whether we ended up with an STD, with the unwanted pregnancy, with being scammed by a guy or being embarrassed by a guy, maybe, I don't know, you have a picture of yourself or a video of yourself floating around where you're doing something sexual and now your body is exposed. These things happen. 
These things happen every single day to us women. And it is embarrassing. And it does feel shameful, especially when your secrets are out. But do you also hide from God? A lot of us stop praying in these situations. We feel so shameful sometimes that we can't even go to God. We can't even face him and say, please help me, help this go away, help me overcome this, because we also think that he's looking at us in that same way, and we feel embarrassed. And it's important to know that this is a time where you should be the closest to God, where you should come to him with all boldness, knowing that he is not us. He does not judge you in that way. He loves you. And he understands all of what goes on in this world and is waiting for you to come and confess and repent. And he is waiting to forgive you. Unlike the world who takes years sometimes to forgive someone for something that they did, God doesn't do that. And so it's important that if you've suffered any kind of rejection because of a decision that you've made to come to God and to pour your heart out to him, and genuinely ask him for help. This society will allow you to continue to remember your problems because misery loves company and that's just kind of how it is. But it doesn't have to be that way for you. Okay, I know a lot of us think about our past failures and the things that are just really harmful and hurtful to us around Valentine's Day. It's a day where a lot of people reflect on their past relationships or what they don't have or what they've done to mess up things. And it does bring about sometimes even embarrassment, feeling like you don't have anyone to give you anything and you should. And all these things can make us kind of hide. But this is a time for you to be bold about the things that you want, the things that you know you've messed up with and come to God. He's waiting for you. He wants you to come to him. I'm going to read from page 98. We know that this woman was hiding because the text said that when Jesus sat down at Jacob's well to rest, it was about noon. Fortunately for her, Jesus wasn't having any part of it. He had come specifically to find her and to provide for her in ways that she could not yet understand, just as he does for you and me. So even though she was hiding, Jesus wasn't having part of it. He came specifically for her to provide for her in ways that she could not yet understand, just like he does for you and me. This woman intentionally endured great hardship and great frustration for a specific purpose. She was hiding from her community. She didn't want to join the other women who were gathering cool water in the morning. She wanted isolation. She wanted solitude. She willingly chose a more difficult path in the present so that she could hide from her past. We do the same today. We make the same effort to hide away the parts of ourselves or the moments from our past that we deem to be inappropriate for public view. We hide in our cars on isolated commutes. We hide behind office doors or under headphones. We hide behind the banality of fruitless, friendly conversation. How are you? I'm fine. Just enjoying this lovely weather. We hide behind the aura of accomplishment and competence we continuously thrust in front of our faces like a shield. We hide behind makeup and hair dye. We hide behind garage doors and social calendars. Many of us are experts at hiding in plain sight. People see us. They talk with us. They know our favorite sports and our hobbies. But they have no idea who we are under the surface. They have no idea what makes us tick, or how our past experiences have formed us and shaped us. In other words, they don't know the real us, down inside, and we do everything possible to keep it that way. Notice the Samaritan woman attempted to hide from Jesus as well. First, she tried to hide behind a veneer of hostility, 
When Jesus asked her for a drink from the well, she snapped back at him. You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Sometimes people who have been hurt are the hardest people in the world to help. Have you noticed that? When you reach out to lend a hand, they smack it away with an attitude. I can tell you from experience that no one fights harder than someone who is drowning. So you better be prepared if you plan to attempt a rescue. Even when your intentions are good, their desperation can be so bad that they just lash out without a thought. You can get killed trying to help someone who's hurting. And that's the dynamic Jesus encountered at Jacob's well. So think about this. In your own life, right now, today, how do you behave when you're hurting? What do you do? Are you short-tempered with people? If you're having a really tough day or a tough season, do you snap at people who try to help you? Do you push others away? If someone texts you and asks how you're doing, do you ignore it? Or maybe respond and say, you're fine, how are you? And push the conversation back at them. Do you recognize when someone genuinely cares for you and wants to help you? Do you really see it that way? And if so, how do you respond to them? I know some of us are private and we don't want to share our trials with people because we don't want to burden them with our problems or we don't trust people. And so we don't want to share something because when everything is fine again, this person has this information about you and you don't want that to get out. Very understandable. Do you prefer to deal with your pain in isolation? I know when I was a teenager, I was very good at this. My mom had no idea, and not just a teenager, pretty much my whole life, what I'm, like, what I'm actually going through. I had such a great way of putting on a face at home just to avoid a conversation because I really didn't want to have a conversation about it. And I remember going through something that was so hard when I was in college and it was my birthday and I just wanted to cry. And I just remember how hard it was holding back those tears and putting on a fake smile on a day where I was supposed to be happy. And it was, I just told myself, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep faking. I need to allow people to know when I'm not okay. It's not okay to put on this face just for other people's comfort. If people truly do love you and it's appropriate for you to share, then you should. And it doesn't mean you have to share the actual issue, but it's okay to share that you're not okay. That, you know what, you're having a hard day without having to go into all the details instead of putting on a smile and just pretending like your day is going great when it's not. That hurts you. So even though I am someone, I consider someone who likes to deal with my pain in isolation, I do still appreciate those who reach out and I do try to let them know that I'm not doing that great, but I'm hopeful so that they can pray so that I can receive. And that, my dear, is part of having boundaries. We'll talk a lot more about boundaries in the future because this is something I really want to make sure I get out to you. It's not just about keeping things out. We think about boundaries, we think about no, right? But boundaries are also what you let in. And when you have very healthy boundaries, you're able to receive from people. You're able to let people in when you need it. You know when a give and take is, is appropriate. And if you're someone who loves to give, you have to also understand what it means to receive and how to receive because receiving is absolutely necessary. Just wisdom is what you would need to know who to receive from, how much to share, when to share, and that sort of thing. But none of us, none of us are exempt from trials and persecution. We all go through things. Maybe what you went through isn't public, but everyone has gone through things that we are embarrassed about, we are ashamed about. It doesn't mean that we want to publicize it, but it also doesn't mean that it didn't happen. So I want you to know that 
just because someone else's issue is not broadcasted doesn't mean they didn't do the same thing you did. No one found out about it. And that's the only difference. So remember that you need to go to God in those moments. And I know through my pain, the most painful things I've ever experienced were always the moments where I felt God the closest to me and I got the closest to him because that's the only place that I could go and be honest because he already knows. And I could just cry and pour my, my heart out to him. Even on days where I was at work and I was literally trying not to cry all day long at work and just could not wait till I got in my car or got home so I could cry and I could talk to the Lord because I needed that support and just wasn't willing to get it from anyone. You don't have to. You can, but you have another option and you need to exercise that option instead of keeping it all in. Going back to the book, Jesus intentionally sought out this specific interaction with this specific woman. There was no physical or geographical reason for Jesus to travel through Samaria. In fact, the Jews and the Samaritans were cultural enemies. They did not like each other, and they preferred to avoid one another. For that reason, Jews rarely traveled through Samaria. However, Jesus chose this particular route. He chose to penetrate enemy territory specifically because he was on a mission to converse and connect with this woman. He was on a mission to save her from drowning. Jesus went through a great deal of effort to prepare the ground for a significant conversation between himself and this woman. And instead of recognizing that effort, Instead of recognizing her opportunity, the woman at the well tried to push Jesus away because he was different. How often do we hide behind our differences as a way of ignoring one another, as a way of refusing to get to know one another? There's no way I'm going to reach out to that person. We don't have anything in common. We came from different backgrounds. We live in different communities. We were raised in different cultures by parents of different colors. We don't look the same or talk the same or think the same or vote the same. Nothing. Therefore, there's no reason to make an effort at a connection. It's all a veneer, a screen, a way to hide behind our differences so we're not confronted with our own prejudices, with our own immaturity. This is major, especially in the community, even of Christians. Okay, a lot of Christ followers are unwilling to connect with others who share different beliefs just because they are someone who identifies as being Buddhist or Muslim or atheist. We think, oh, mm -mm, I can't. If I get close to that, I might catch it. Or they think I'm right, they're wrong, and so we have nothing to talk about. Or they're truly just afraid that this person may have questions or may have information that they truly can't answer. They don't know enough about their own Christianity or their own relationship with God. And they're afraid, they're intimidated that they may get found out. And this is unfortunate because we end up getting separated and not having opportunities to chat with one another about our own personal testimonies about the things that just make us who we are. And whether or not this person is older than you, because a lot of times we tend to not want to have conversations with people who are out of our age range. I've seen so many people be so rude to old people because it's like, oh, they're old. I don't want to talk to them. Or like, we're just so different. Like this person's like 90, I'm 25. Why would I be talking to you? Or they're different skin complexion or different um, a different race. And all of those things are our differences, which is a beautiful thing. And it allows us to be able to connect because we have something different to talk about. We have different perspectives because we come from different places. I remember being on an airplane, going to a wedding, and I was landing in a city that was assumed to be very racist. I did not know this, but I was told this every time I said, I'm going here. They're like, oh, you're going there. Why? 
like I'm just going for a wedding. But while I was on the plane, I was sitting next to this woman, an older Caucasian woman who was very wealthy appearing. She just looked very wealthy. And she kind of had this like, (laughs) I don't want to say snotty, but she kind of had this air about her. And she asked me a couple of questions. And when she found out that I was a doctor, I think, I don't know, I just think that's what made her feel comfortable talking with me. Um, Maybe she felt like, okay, she's black, but at least she's educated so we can talk, right? She was really interesting. She wasn't necessarily nice, but she did find out I was a Christian and wanted to kind of just pour into me. So she was telling me different things. She didn't, she wasn't warm, put it this way. She wasn't warm, but she appeared to want to genuinely help me. And when we landed, she was like, okay, who's picking you up? And I was like, my husband's going to get me. And she's like, well, I don't feel comfortable with you being at the airport without me because this place is super racist. I don't want anything happening to you. So I'll wait with you until your husband comes. I'm like, we're in an airport. No one's going to do anything to me. I'm okay. I don't need you to stay here. It's okay. (laughs) I know that you're concerned and I'm concerned that you're this concerned, but I ultimately know, you know, I just had faith that I would be okay, but she just would not listen. She stayed with me the whole time until my husband came to pick me up. And it was just really interesting being in a place where she was warning me that I was not accepted, that I was different. And the only thing that really connected her to me was the fact that we were both Christians and She felt at that point the need to pour into me, to protect me. And it was very sweet. But this kind of thing happens often where that woman maybe wouldn't have spoken to me at all if she wouldn't have found out information that made her comfortable with me. And I am happy that she did. And I'm happy that she stepped out of what seemed to be her comfort zone to push through that in order to help me. And I believe we should all be doing things like that. And I also want to say, putting a different spin on this, is sometimes we don't want to receive help from people because we think that because of our differences, they're better than us. Like, I could have thought, oh, this woman's like this rich Caucasian woman. What is she doing talking to me? Little old me. Do I deserve this conversation? Uh, People do this all the time where someone who has power or who is a celebrity or it could be something, it could be someone at your job that is the CEO or the superintendent and they're having a conversation. You just feel so lucky that the superintendent or the CFO is talking to you and you put them on such a pedestal that if they genuinely try to help you or to know you, you can't even accept it because you don't feel worthy of it. This happens Um, when people are talking to like an extremely attractive person, say you met a man who was extremely attractive and he wanted to go on a date with you or he wanted to get to know you. And you might think me, I'm like, you're so hot. You're so good looking. Why would you want to talk to me? And even though he may seemingly see like, seem like someone that is a good person, like you don't have any red flags about it. You just may not be able to accept his genuine love because you don't feel worthy. And we do this all the time. This is how some of us relate to Jesus. We feel like we have done so many things. We've lived such a sinful lifestyle. We are so unworthy. Even if we just did something horrible and then we need his help, we won't want to pray because it's like... Ooh, this morning I was just watching porn and now I'm in a predicament and I need to talk to God, but clearly he doesn't want to talk to me because this morning I was watching porn. That's how we talk to ourselves. And that's not how Jesus thinks about us or relates to us. So we then don't pray and we move further away from him because we've made this decision. We made this, this sin, this mistake. And it's important for you to know that the Lord is always by our side, no matter what, even when you don't want to pray and you don't want to acknowledge him, he's still there. But a lot of times he feels really far from us because we move away. He doesn't move. We move. We feel bad. We feel shameful. So we keep moving and moving and moving. And then we don't feel him anymore. We don't sense him anymore. We don't 
connect with him quickly anymore because we were so ashamed that we moved so far away. So it's important that you don't hide and that you know that he loves you. He knows where you are. He knows what you're doing. And he loves you no less because of your bad decisions. It's just important for you to come back. In the book, it says, there is no hiding from God. There are no secrets between yourself and God. There is no distracting him from seeing all the things you prefer to keep shrouded about your past. There is no confusing him about knowing all the thoughts that swim around, swim around in your mind and in your heart. These thoughts you try to keep hidden even from yourself. God knows. He always knows. He always sees. Therefore, this is a principle I hope you will take to heart. When you come before God in prayer, come honestly. Come openly. Come prepared to acknowledge all the ways that you have rebelled against him and all the times you have been focused on yourself because he already knows. Not only that, he's already made provision to forgive you. He's already mapped out a special trip just to meet you and talk with you, just to heal you and save you if you'll open your heart and accept what he offers. No matter how embarrassed you are about your lifestyle, about your decisions, about the things that swirl around in your mind, he loves you and he's offering his help to you. He's offering you living water. He's asking you to give him a chance and drink from his well. So he's offering you water to get you out of your depression, water to give you courage to set appropriate boundaries for your life so that you can be free of other people's control over your life. He's offering you water to forgive those who hurt you. Forgive yourself for the bad things that you did when you were a teenager. He's offering you water to quench your thirst of loneliness and abandonment. He has water for you that will never run out. You will never be thirsty again when you drink from his water. So do you want the Lord's living water? Is this something that you are ready to take? Are you ready to be set free? Do you want it? Because he's offering it to you. And he will make appointments to meet you where you are and to talk with you. He, just like this woman, will go out of his way, do something that is completely unusual to meet with you where you are. It doesn't matter if you're in the middle of the club, if you're at some guy's house that you know you shouldn't be at, if you're in the middle of a drug deal, it doesn't matter what you're doing or where you are. He will meet you there. So you don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to wait. You can be wherever you are in the moment and say, God, I need you right now. And he will show up. He's waiting. What the woman did not realize, indeed, what she could not have realized at this point in the conversation is that Jesus himself is a wellspring of life. Jesus himself is a fountain of hope and goodness and provision. In other words, she did not understand that she was talking to a well, sitting on a well. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks this water will never be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them, <laughs> I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This was an unmistakable offer of his incredible value. This was Jesus himself offering himself. Next came the crux of their conversation, the pivotal moment. The woman answered by saying, sir, give me this water 
so that I will never get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. My sister, may I submit to you that there is no pure expression of prayer than what that woman asked of Jesus in that moment. Sir, give me this water. That is the essence of prayer. After all, what is prayer but recognizing our own emptiness and asking God to fill us with what we need? Lord God, I have been searching for acceptance for so long in so many places. Please give me your acceptance. Lord God, I have been trying to find love for longer than I can express. Please give me your love. Lord God, I am in need of joy and peace and comfort and purpose and blessing. Please give me what I need. In short, prayer is simply saying, Lord, I am thirsty. Please fill me with yourself. This woman had a thirst for companionship. She had a thirst for relationship. She had a thirst to be loved, which is a thirst we all experience. It's a thirst we all share. But what she had been trying to quench, that thirst in all the wrong places and in all the wrong ways. Make no mistake, the devil always has solutions for your thirst. The devil will always show you different ways to get your needs met. But he's a liar. He wants to devour you. His goal is your destruction. This world is filled with solutions for your thirst. The economy of our culture is built on inflaming every kind of thirst inside you and then selling you false promises to quench those thirsts. Do not believe those promises. All that glitters is not gold. Just because it winks at you doesn't mean it's a blessing. Just because it feels good doesn't mean it won't harm you in the long run. Just because it makes sense to everyone else does not mean it's the right choice for you. Jesus wanted to show this woman a better way, himself, the living water. And Jesus wants to show you a better way as well, because he knows you're thirsty. God knows you're thirsty for approval. God knows you're thirsty for a career that fulfills you rather than making you feel drained. God knows you are thirsty for someone to love you in a way that makes you feel alive again. God knows you are thirsty for the laughter of children in your house. God knows you are thirsty for the education you had to abandon when you were young. God knows you are thirsty for just one month or maybe an entire year where all your bills are paid and there is food on the table and you don't have to feel so squeezed because there's not, because there's more than enough. God knows you are thirsty. He is a well sitting on the well, and he is able to quench your thirst. He wants to quench your thirst. The question is, will you let him? So I want you to think about this. Have you poured your heart out to the Lord yet? There is no need for embarrassment. The Lord just put it on my heart that some of you may even be considering having plastic surgery because you don't feel like you're beautiful. You feel like in order for you to attract the man that you want or attract the life that you want, you need to look different and you need to change your body or change your face. And I want to encourage you to pray about this. I want to encourage you to know that the Lord knew exactly how you were going to look because he created you to look that way for a purpose. And just because it doesn't reflect what everyone else thinks is beautiful right now does not mean that you are not beautiful. And whoever that person is that needs to hear that, I hope that you take it and you truly think about it and pray about it before going through with it. Because this is something that many of us women consider doing because of society, because of social media, because we think that it's going to open the door for us to then live a beautiful life. And it doesn't. And 
this is something I could go on and on about because being someone who's known quite a number of people who have gone under the knife in various places of their body are still some of the most insecure people I have ever met. And it never stops, not necessarily the surgeries, but the need for approval, the need to believe that someone truly cares about them. It never stops. Nothing ever changes. They may look different. They may look younger. They may look like their face is perfect. But on the inside, that's where they needed the surgery. And the only person who can do that kind of surgery is Jesus. So I encourage you to pray about it. And to know that none of your pain is wasted. Everything that you've gone through, the Lord is going to use that. And he is going to flip things around and you just have to trust him and see. I can talk about this all day, all night, but if you won't actually step forward and do it, then you will never know. It'll just be words. And I want this to be more than just encouragement. I want it to be your reality. And for you to say, I heard this, I have faith in this, I stood on it and look what happened. I'm changed. I don't want you to be in the same place today in six months. That can't happen. So these things do need to be put into your life. Confess your sins and invite God into your life. Invite Jesus to be your savior. And he will do it. And I found a psalm that I think will help you if you're someone who wants to know about the joy of the Lord's forgiveness. Psalm 32 I especially like verses one through seven, and I'll read it to you. One second. So this is Psalm chapter 32. How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is the man the Lord does not charge with sin, and in whose spirit is no, no deceit. When I kept silence, my bones became brittle. From my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was drained as in the summer's heat. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you took away the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is faithful pray to you at a time that you may be found. When the great floodwaters come, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with joyful shouts of deliverance. And this is Psalm 32, 1 through 7. This is the, the joy of forgiveness, of knowing that you've been holding on to these things and you've been ashamed, but they've been wearing you down. And you poured your heart out to the Lord and you told him the truth and you're now living in his grace and under his protection. And there is no better place, no better feeling than knowing that no matter what, unlike your, unlike your parents here, unlike your friends, unlike your man Unlike your coworkers, unlike your children, God actually forgives you immediately and forgets. And that's a beautiful thing. And lastly, I just want to share the importance. For so many of you, I have gotten so many messages and it's just such a blessing. And I thank God every single day when I receive messages about how your lives have actually changed and how you've invited the Lord into your life. And so many things have happened to you. Engagements, marriages, being renewed and restored. Being free of lots of different bondages. Being healed of sickness and diseases. All of these things that have come out, I'm so grateful. And I want you to not just tell me, but allow your testimony to be something that you share with the world. It doesn't mean that you have to broadcast things. It doesn't mean that you have to tell people every private thing about your life. But in order to truly be a disciple, the Lord wants the glory for what he's done. He doesn't want you to just keep it to yourself. You don't have to convert anyone into being a Christian. That's not your job. Your job is just to share what's 
gone on with you. And it could be to a stranger at a store who's having a difficult time. You can say, you know, I remember when I was trying to get pregnant and I was I wasn't able to enjoy my pregnancy because I kept thinking that I was going to lose my baby and I didn't take any pictures. I didn't buy anything, but the Lord allowed me to have a baby and I'm so grateful. And I encourage you to go ahead and take the pictures, go ahead and buy the items and have faith. That small conversation could change someone's life and you're giving glory to God. You're also allowing someone to take on that faith and that's how the Lord can start to work in that person. You're not convincing them of anything. You're just sharing, and it's the Lord's job. It's the job of the Holy Spirit to be able to penetrate through that person's heart and allow them to see God in what you're saying. It's supernatural. It's not something you have to force or do. All you have to do is your part in sharing, and that's what this woman did. She went back into town, and she said that she's met this person that's told her everything she's ever done, even though all he did was mention that she's had five husbands. The Holy Spirit worked through her in allowing her to sense and know it wasn't just the five husbands that he knew about. He knew her. He knew her whole life. The Lord was able to penetrate through her heart in that way. And that's what the Holy Spirit does when you evangelize. Okay, so I want you to understand how important that is. It's not something I ever felt that I could do. Like me doing these lives here is still a shock to me because I never saw myself doing anything like this. But when I saw how much Jesus loved me, someone who was so bad, (laughs) so bad, and how much he just flipped my entire life around and gave me a new start and changed me, I was like, okay, everyone needs to know about this. Because if it was a good movie or a good nail shop or good food, good anything, I'd be telling everyone. I'd be so quick to share it with someone else. So this is the most important thing that's ever happened to me. I have to share this with you and hope that you will take it upon yourself and hope that you can look at my life in terms of just certain things And see God working and be able to at least say, okay, hmm, let me, let me give it a try. You know, that's, that's it. (laughs) Because we all know that you could be doing something else right now. I could be doing something else right now. And the only reason we're here is because of the Lord, because we want something more and we know it's out there, but you have to take a leap of faith and get it. I really want that for you. So my dear, just remember that God sees you. He sees you and you are forgiven. I want to go ahead and go into prayer. So please close your eyes and agree with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to have this beautiful lesson on your love. The story of the woman at the well and how Jesus made a divine appointment to be with her to offer her living water. We thank you for your offer of living water today. We thank you that you are willing to allow us to know Jesus, to be saved of our sins, to have eternal life, and to receive your gift of the Holy Spirit. We receive all that you have for us in this moment. We ask for forgiveness for all of our sins, and we ask that you help us to forgive anyone who has sinned against us. We receive your power, we receive your authority to be able to change our lives, to be able to live the life that you created for us. We trust you and we know, Lord Jesus, that you are our protection, you are our comfort, you are our guide, and we are ready to be with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, ladies. So I wanted to first say that I will not be here for the next two Sundays, just in case. um, Obviously, you'd probably be here because we have more women to go through. As a matter of fact, the next person we're going to talk about in our book is Queen Esther. And you know that I've already done an entire series on Esther. So if you want, you can take this time next week to go through that playlist And just watch a couple videos on Esther because her story, 
is so beautiful to me. It's my favorite story in the Bible. I resonate greatly with that story and I've covered it in so much depth, but we will still cover it next, sorry, in two weeks. So I'll be back in March. The next time I'll be live is March 6th. The next two Sundays, I will not be here. And if you need to catch up on any of these lives, then I suggest you take the time to do that. But when we do return, we'll be talking about Esther. And the theme is when women pray, they gain victory over injustice. So that's going to be the theme. I also want to let you know that there's a show that I love so much. And it's called The Chosen. And it's a show about Jesus's life. It is the coolest show I have ever seen about Jesus. Well, it's the first show, but it's the coolest representation I've ever seen of Jesus. Because when I think of Jesus from how I read the Bible, that's how I think of him. Not how he's been depicted in pretty much every other movie I've watched. He's just been so like serious and like, I don't know, just weird. In this show... It's like, okay, legit, I could see Jesus being just like this person. It's such a blessed show. And it allowed me to get closer to Jesus. I believe it will allow you to get closer to Jesus. It shows his true personality in the sense that he was funny. He was cool. He was swaggy. Like, he was all those things. He wasn't this, like, weird, boring guy. He was a reflection of of us, of God. And um, there is an episode specifically on this woman when he meets her at the well. And I will try to find it and link it because it's on YouTube. So you can just watch it here. You don't have to pay for it. But I would suggest that you watch that. They also have an episode on some of the other people we've talked about. They have an episode on the birth of Jesus. You know how we talked about Mary and her life. And that episode was really nice. I think... Yeah, that's the only other person that they've had episodes on. So I would recommend that you watch it again. It's called The Chosen, and I think you'll really enjoy it. It's such a good show, and I will find the link for you. And also, I do have giveaways every week on these podcasts or these um, these videos. So if you go to my Instagram page, A Feminine Impression, and you look for the title of whatever we talked about, I usually open it for 24 hours and you just have to leave a comment about how this resonated with you, what your thoughts were. And if you're in the U.S., you can enter and win something really special from me. And again, lastly, if you weren't here earlier in this show, we talked about the fact that we're having a sale from Fine Forever, 25% off of my fragrance, 2911 from Jeremiah 2911. And use the code VALENTINE to get 25% off. There are two bottle sizes. So if you're someone who loves fragrance and um, wants to get the bigger bottle, I think this would be the best time to do it since the price will be so well adjusted. So thank you again, ladies. I'm going to take some time just to answer a couple of questions. For anyone who has some questions, I have about 12-ish minutes. So... Let me go ahead and so if you have any questions about this particular story, about anything about God, let me know and just leave a comment. I'm going to try to see if I can find any questions I missed earlier. The show is called The Chosen and it's here on YouTube. And thank you. I know I announced on my Instagram page, if you follow my personal Instagram page, it's Dr. Michelle Daff. And I announced that I am pregnant. So excited. And I actually am going to have a video coming up this week talking about my pregnancy and just how that came about because I think it's the coolest freaking thing. And it ties right into what we talk about here about just God's promises. And that's why my fragrance line is so important to me because I'm not just like selling a dream. Like I lean on the promises of God so hard and he just always comes through. He always comes through. And I want to talk about how he came through for me in me being able to conceive. So thank you so much. 
Um, oh, someone said that they were thinking of plastic surgery on your nose specifically. I see. I believe that. I believe that because as I was speaking, the Lord just put it on my heart. Like, please mention this because I need my daughters to know, like, they need to chill on this. So I'm really happy that it touched you. So if you have any questions, I'm going scrolling up, but I'm going to go ahead and scroll down. Just want to see if I missed anything. Thank you for all the congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will try to link that specific episode, but if you just type in on YouTube, The Chosen Show, they kind of have it. It's a little tricky. It's a little tricky. I think I might even have it linked already. If you scroll on the description on this video, I think it may already be linked somewhere. It's, it's one of those shows you could just totally binge watch. It's so good. Watching from Zimbabwe. Wow, thank you for being here all the way from Zimbabwe. Thank you so much. And thank you for those of you who weren't asking me if I was pregnant. You probably assumed it, but I thank you for not asking because I do think that's really rude. And I... I know a lot of you kind of suspected it and you kept it to yourself. And I just want to say, I appreciate that. I do. Crystal saying she needs to pour her heart out more to the Lord. I think we all do. I think we all forget how much he cares for us. Someone's talking about, okay, I almost had a divorce, but everything worked out better than that little gap brings me so much shame. I know if time passes, it'll be okay, but the family gossip hurts and makes me want to hide. I'm so sorry that that's happened with you. Family gossip is unreal. And that's something that I really just want you to continue to pray about and forgive and understand that when people do that, when people gossip, especially about their own family, it shows how miserable they are. And there's nothing good that comes from that. It's important that you separate yourself from that. Don't try to prove yourself. Don't try to stick up for yourself and answer unnecessary questions. This is a time to really pray that the Lord allows you to have strong boundaries in the sense that you talk about what you want to talk about, what you're comfortable talking about. They are in no position to judge you for what's happened in your life. And if you could pull over the sheets on what's going on in their life, I guarantee you it would be so ugly because only ugliness breeds things like gossip. A person who's truly hurting on the inside, truly insecure, truly sometimes just evil. Okay, let's just call it what it is. Sometimes they're just evil and that's what's inside of them and that's why they're doing this. So Pray about that so that you don't get pulled into that. Thank you so much for all of your congratulations. Okay, you found The Chosen on Daystar channel. I don't know what that is. They have their own channel here on YouTube. They also have an app called The Chosen. And the reason why I like that app is because if you watch their videos on YouTube, there's a ton of talking in the beginning. Like you have to fast forward to like 50 minutes for the show to start because they're like live shows in the sense where people are watching live and the person that produced it talks. It's like this whole thing. So if you just download the app, The Chosen, you can watch all of the episodes. It's like spelled out really nicely. There's no interruptions. You get right through it and it's free. You just have to download the app. So I would recommend you do that. All right, ladies. Well, if there are no other questions, then I just want to say thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for being consistent as well and um, being here every single Sunday. I hope that this has been blessing you. I hope that it's been changing your lives. And if you do have testimonies, I encourage you to share them however you feel comfortable, but never be ashamed of the Lord. If you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you. And he's been too good to you to be quiet about.
he's been too good to you. So just remember that. All right. Okay. Well, I will see you ladies in two weeks on March 6th. God willing, I will be here to talk about Queen Esther. Until then, read in the actual Bible. If you don't have the book, just read the book of Esther. Read the entire book of Esther. And there's also a video on, on Queen Esther here on YouTube that I love. It's called One Night with the King. And it's a really good movie after you've read it yourself because it's a little, there's a little differences here and there. After you've read it in the Bible, you can watch the movie and just kind of really soak into her story. And then you'll be well prepared on March 6th when I come back. All right. Have a wonderful blessed weekend. Have a wonderful Valentine's Day. And I will see you ladies in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye, ladies.